today is the sixth of Sunday after Pentecost. And we will be here again in uh, Manchester here in Tennessee. And the epistle for this is the epistle for this sixth Sunday of Pentecost is taken. The sixth Pentecost is taken from the epistle of St. Paul of the Romans, chapter 6. Brethren, all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death. We are buried together with him by baptism unto death. That is, that, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, to the end that we may serve sin no longer. For he that is dead is, it, it, dead is justified from, from sin. Now if he be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ. Knowing that Christ, rising again from the dead, dieth now no more, Death shall no more have dominion over him. For he for in that he died to sin. He died once, but as he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also reckon that you are dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the gospel. Take that according to St. Mark, chapter 8. At that time when there was a great multitude with Jesus, and they had nothing to eat, Calling to his disciples together, he saith to them, I have compassion on the multitude, for behold, they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I shall send them away fasting to their homes, they will, fa they will faint in the way. For some of them came from afar off, and the disciples answered him, From whence can anyone fill them who are here with bread in the wilderness? And he asked them, how many loaves have you? Who said, Seven. And he commanded the multitude to sit down upon the ground. And taking the seven loaves, the giving thanks, he broke and gave to his disciples, for to, for, for to set before them. And they set them before the people. And they had a few little fishes. And he blessed them, and commanded them to be set before them. And they did eat. And that were filled, and they took up the that which was left of the fragments, seven baskets, and they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. That's what the words of today's holy God. Considerations today, two ways of looking at the world. One of the ways is the way of the pagans, and also the way actually of the modern heresy of evolution. And that is, everything is a matter of good luck and bad luck, it's a matter of chance. Things just evolve over time, and things just happen, and there's no order, and there's no control, and there's no structure over it. As I believe of many of the pagans and many people also, there was once a farmer, the story comes from a Spaniard, once a farmer in Spain a few hundred years ago, and he went and he bought a horse. He got a horse for a very, very cheap price. He said, this is a very good horse. And this horse is a, is a you know, he got him a very cheap price. He said, oh, I got a horse. I got a horse. Good luck, good luck. So he brought the horse home. And when he brought the horse home, the next day he walked out to see the horse, and the horse was lame. And he was hobbling. He goes, oh, the horse is lame. Bad luck, bad luck. Well, then he looked at the horse, and he picked up the hoof of the horse, and he found that there was a huge gold piece inside of the horse's hoof. He pulled out the gold piece, and he said, good luck, good luck. And then the gold piece was stolen. Bad luck, bad luck. 
And the next day when his horse got better, his son went out to feed the horse. And, and the horse got mad, and he kicked his son in the head. And so he said, bad luck, bad luck. And his, his son was laid up in bed. While his son was laid up in bed, his 18, 20-year-old son was laid up in bed, the army came by. The army came by, and they were stealing young men to bring them off to war. And they went to catch, they grabbed all the young men, and they came to his young, his son, but his son had his head kicked in, and he was in bed. So he didn't have to go to war. He said, good luck, good luck. So one day, good luck. Another day, bad luck. Another day, good luck. Another day, bad luck. But what is the history of the horse? And here we consider also St. Ambrose, Consider the situation of why God allows good and bad things to happen in our lives. Not only the good and bad things that happen without our direct control, but even the good and bad things happen with our control. For instance, we read about in the sacred scripture today, in the bravery, we read about King David. David, remember, he was very brave as a young man. He was 12 years old, and he killed Goliath, and he fought very bravely, to become king. And he had to overcome great obstacles to become king. And as he was becoming stronger and stronger, somehow David changed. Something happened to David. He became very proud. And he, he lost his, his, his virtue that he had when he was young. And he became also impure. And he lost his sense of the holy. And one day he decided to commit adultery with Bathsheba. And then he decided to murder the wife, the, her husband, Urias. And he thought he got away with it all. And God allowed him to commit this great sin. He committed a terrible sin. But then what happened? Nathan came. The prophet Nathan came. We read about the prophet Nathan today. The prophet Nathan came and told a story to David. David did not realize that his heart had changed. He said, I am still the same David that I was when I was 12 years old. I'm the same David that went and fought against Goliath. I'm the same David that had to flee from my enemies. And I went to the priest and he gave me the sword of Goliath. And I carried the sword of Goliath in the battle. I'm the same David that has conquered all my enemies and now rules the kingdom. I still am the same as I always was. I haven't changed. I haven't changed. I haven't changed. And yet his heart had changed. And he had become wicked. He had become exceedingly proud. He had become very cold in his heart, so much so that he was able to murder his top general. Remember when he murdered Urias, he first tried to cover his adultery by, by having Urias come home. Urias would not come to his home. And then he sent Urias out into battle, and he told Joab, charge the battle. Bring Urias with you into battle, and then tell all the men secretly, but don't tell Urias to retreat so that the enemy will kill Urias. And they'll think he just died in battle, because men die in battle. And so Joab obeyed the wicked command of David, so that he would murder Urias, and no one could catch him. No one could catch him. He had become very wise. But then one day Nathan came up to him, and he said, David, you say you're the same David you always were? Oh yes, I'm the same. I haven't changed. He said, well... I have heard of a young man in your kingdom, a rich man. And this rich man has many sheep. But his neighbor was a very poor man, who was extremely poor, had only one sheep. And he loved his sheep very much. He used to the sheep live with him in his own house. But then, a neighbor, someone came to a feast. And the rich man, instead of taking his many sheep, he decided to go to his neighbor and take the only sheep he had, and his only companion that he loved very much, and he killed the sheep. And he served that sheep rather than one of his own sheep for the feast. And David became extremely angry. And he said, this man is very wicked. I can't believe that he took from the other sheep of the other one. And therefore he said he must be punished most severely. And that this is a terrible thing. And then Nathan said, thou art that man. What happened to David? David had tribulations when he was young. David had to fight to become king. But then David stopped having sorrows. And David stopped having problems. And David began to be powerful. And there David, therefore, he corrupted. He became very proud. 
even to the point of, of adultery and murder. And, he, and when he committed the adultery and committed the murder, he had no repentance of any kind. Therefore Nathan came to him, the prophet, and he said, Thou art the one, David. What happened to you? You were the, you were the boy that with great bravery went and fought against Goliath. You were the one that refused to kill Saul, though you could have killed him many times. You were the one that showed great bravery and such holiness. What happened to you? You have been filled with pride. You have been filled with wickedness. And you have murdered Urias, your greatest general. Why did you do that? And David immediately wept. He immediately wept. St. Ambrose says, Though David had turned to great wickedness, David did turn to great wickedness, but he still had the heart of Christ in him, and when his wickedness was exposed to him, and was made out loud, and made known, and when it was confessed publicly, when it was confessed before him, he immediately recognized his fault, and he wept. And he composed the Psalm 50, Misery may, 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 don't, don't, may, may, have mercy on me, O Lord, have mercy on me, and sprinkle with Isaac, and I shall be cleansed. His great miserere, the psalm of begging mercy, that he is Psalm 50 that he wrote because of the fact that he had done this great wickedness. And David transformed his heart. God allowed him even to commit this great sin in order that it might be exposed to him. You think you're great because you did great things when you were young. You think you're great because you were brave and you did not murder Saul. And you're even filled with a holy wrath. We read about David last week with his holy wrath. That he had a holy anger, a holy anger because Saul was murdered. Saul was killed. And then in the holy anger of David, he killed the one that killed Saul. He did not rejoice that Saul was dead. Saul had tried to kill him many times. He didn't care about his own life. But now he was so much cared about his own good name and so much cared about his own life that he was willing to murder. He was willing to, to cover up the most vile of sins and not feel the smallest remorse of conscience. And therefore, God allowed him to be exposed before his heart was so corrupted that he could not repent. God allows that there be ups and downs in our lives. He even allows sometimes that we fall. We fall on our own because of our own wickedness. And then he allows us to face our own weakness. And when we face our weakness, we must have the wisdom of David. St. Ambrose says, consider the great wisdom of David. Before he did the terrible sin of murdering Urias and of the sin of, 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 of adultery with Bathsheba, before, and then because of the word that the terrible sin, he was slowly becoming more wicked. But after he committed the sin, what does he say in the Psalm of Israel? That we read in the most sacred psalm of penance that we all read. My sin is always before me. He will not forget that he is a sinner. And when David no longer forgets that he is a sinner, his heart becomes more and more like unto Christ. And when he has trials from then on, he will flee from Absalom. He will have to flee from Absalom. And also David, Nathan tells him, because you have committed this great sin, God has forgiven you because of your love. He's forgiven you because you have wept. But you must still experience trials. You must experience trials. We must remember that our Lord Jesus Christ and the saints tell us, the heart of Christ is the heart of David. And when David repented on this day, he repented for the remainder of his days. But then at the very end of his life, he would have a small problem of pride again, the very end. But he repented for the remainder of his days. And David had deep love in his heart. And his sin was always before him. But what did God allow to happen to David throughout his entire life? Continual wars. Continual to, to strife. Continual difficulties. And the saints talk about this all the time. Look at David. And look at his son Solomon. Solomon was wise. And Solomon was given the gift of the greatest wisdom that any man has ever received in the history of the entire world. He is a human author of the book of wisdom. And many of the Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon is the author of these wise words that are for all of us. He was the wise one. But Solomon did not have great tribulations in his life. Solomon didn't have all kinds of ups and downs. 
Therefore Solomon collapsed, and Solomon turned to pride. And Solomon is believed by some of the fathers of the church who have even lost his soul. And if he did save his soul, he barely saved it. Solomon ended up building temples to false gods. Solomon collapsed because of the, well, the, he married women. He, was, he, was, he could have many wives of the Jews, but he was, he was not satisfied with the Jewish women. He wanted to go to those strange women. He wanted to go to the women outside of Israel. And he brought them in with their gods. David never did that. David did many sins. David had many weaknesses, but David always remained faithful to God and quickly repented. Hence we see, those whom God loves, he chastises. Those whom God loves experience good luck and bad luck, followed by good luck, followed by bad luck, followed by good luck, followed by bad luck. God allows these things to happen in order that we be reminded that the greatest sin that destroys our souls is the terrible sin of pride. And we must be reminded that we are weak and God alone is strong. We are weak and we depend upon Christ. And even if we are instruments of God in a great victory, we are only that, instruments of God. It was a donkey that carried Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Because he could only sit on one donkey. So one donkey had to be the donkey. The other donkeys could not be the donkey. And that donkey thought he was very special. He thought he was quite special. It turned out the next day, he was just another donkey. He did not seem so special anymore. And so that we, we, that he was, he, God had to choose one donkey and he chose this one. He could have chosen that one. We must remember that we are donkeys in the kingdom of Christ. That we carry Christ upon, upon us, and we carry Christ to the ends of the earth. All of us, the priests, of course, in a special way, but the, every baptized Catholic must carry Christ. And that there, God will allow there to be struggles in our lives. He'll allow there to be good times and bad times and struggles. Some struggles cause on the outside. But notice David. He had many exterior struggles before he murdered Uriah's. He was only good, and he was only holy before he murdered Urias, before he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And, but, but after that, his heart became much better than it was before, and he remembered always his sin, for he was always weak, he was always capable of falling, but he began to have confidence in his own strength and his own wisdom rather than God's strength and God's wisdom. Therefore, he sang his miserere often, we sing this hymn most, as David sang it most often in his 50, 150 psalms. We also imitate David. And we sing this psalm more than any other psalm. The Psalm 50 It's the most common psalm that we sing, sing in the Holy Mother Church. The Miserere. And so, we must remember that God allows good things and bad things to happen. Struggles and good things and struggles and good things. And there must be struggles. Right now, our Lord is allowing there to be a crisis in the church again. This last 50 years since Vatican II, now 60 years almost. And that this, there is, there is this crisis now in our country, whether it's locking down the country and being turned to a communist state. Now as we're being turned to a communist state, we must look back to our ancestors who had to live under communism and the wickedness of that type of sin throughout the last 2,000 years. In these tribulations, they form saints. In these tribulations, they remain strong. In these tribulations, they still turn to God. And there were many martyrs and many saints, many, many, many great saints during this time of tribulation. But they must remember in the time of tribulation, God allows it to remind us that blessings come from Him and not from our own selves. And hence, there must be struggles, there must be difficulties, there must be challenges. And David became a changed man. And his sin was always before him, and he wept, and God forgave him. But then what did Nathan say? You are forgiven, David. But does that mean from here on out it's a life of peace? No. You will still experience the punishment of your sins. And here we remember a teaching of the Holy Mother of the Church. We are either going to suffer for our sins that we have committed in this world or in the next. In the next, the punishment is infinitely severe. Not only for those that are damned in hell because they're not sorry for their sins, but also for those that are sorry for their sins and die with sorrow, but not without sufficient payment, they go to the fires of purgatory, 
which the saints tell us are just as hot as the fires of hell. And the pain is just as bad as the fires of hell. The only difference is these pains end and these pains purify. We don't want to experience those pains. Therefore, our Lord allows us to experience trials and tribulations in this life. Small ones in comparison to that which comes to be afterwards. And we are to experience trials and tribulations. Some of them are only because of the outside. Saints have tribulations only because of the wicked people on the outside. But the rest of us poor sinners, we have tribulations partly because of the wicked people on the outside, but partly because of our own sins. David, what happened? He brought sin into his family. And Nathan said, you have brought sin into your family. The child that, uh, that is illegitimate that should be born of the Bathsheba, you shall have a great love of this child, and this child shall die. And so the child died. And I will bring up, as you have divided the house of Urias and murdered Urias and broke his home, I will bring up evil in your own home. There shall rise up evil in your own house. And as you have experienced adultery, so also adultery shall be experienced by you. As you have committed the sin with others, the others, only you did it secretly. Nathan said, you did adultery secretly. But the time will come when your wives shall be at a state of adultery, and it shall not be secret, it shall be open. And this happened many years later, when Absalom committed sin with the wives of David openly, that there might be a mockery of his house. And David recognized that these things happened, that Absalom turned against him, and that, and that the, the wives were put into the state of adultery because of his own sin. And later on, when Absalom turned against David, what did David do? He recognized, I suffer this as a just reward for my crimes. He repeated the words, or said the words in advance, that the good thief would say on the cross, Why am I being crucified, said St. Dismas, because I'm suffering the just reward of my crimes. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ is crucified in innocence, but the rest of us, it is not so. Even the great David, David who was filled with such a perfect heart, he had sins, and he, was, and he would experience sorrows in his own house. Absalom would rise against him, and Absalom would strive to kill him. He'd have to flee Absalom, and that is why David said to Joab on the last day of Absalom's life, Preserve Absalom, my son. Absalom tried to kill me. Absalom tried to destroy my kingdom. Absalom committed adultery with, with my wives. Absalom destroyed my name. Absalom did such great evil. Do not kill him. Because these things were allowed to happen because of my sin. When David said, my sin is always before me, he was not saying only poetic words. Until the day he died, his sin was always before him. And he experienced the two mysteries of perfect and beautiful sorrow. And one of them is, he never doubted the forgiveness of God. And he kept the love of God in his heart. He never once doubted that God forgave him. He never once questioned the divine love. But at the same time, he recognized, I have still sinned and I must receive the punishment. If you steal a thousand dollars... You are forgiven for stealing a thousand dollars, and you must return the thousand dollars. You must return it. You're forgiven for it, and you return it. It is not enough to be forgiven. So we must recognize in the sins of our own lives. Each of us has some sins in our lives. We will experience betrayals. We have betrayed Christ. We will experience attacks of injustice on the outside. We have been unjust to Christ and to our neighbor, not only to Christ. Therefore, we deserve to experience a little bit of injustice back our own way. We deserve to experience a little bit of spit our own way. We deserve to experience a cross. And many of these crosses are self-constructed. Absalom turned against David. Why? Because he was David's son. And David betrayed Urias. And David murdered his own general Urias. And so the most natural thing in the world is that one of Absalom's sons, David's son, named Absalom, should also betray David. And David betrayed after so many blessings from God. And so Absalom would betray after so many gifts and such great treatment by his own father. And when this happened, rather than David becoming very angry with Absalom, I was so good to you, I treated you better than my other sons. 
I didn't punish you when you murdered your own brother. I didn't do that. I accepted, I accepted, you, you, I forgave you for your faults, and now you're turning against me. I gave you power in my kingdom. David was not offended that Absalom was against David. David was only concerned about the glory of God. And only he recognized that David deserved to suffer because of his own sins. And we must be reminded that we must repent of our sins, but we must also recognize that when difficulties come our way, it is a blessing that our hearts not turn to pride. It is a strengthening of our souls that they might grow and continue and persevere in faith, but it is also the just reward for our crimes. For those of you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.